Hi, welcome. And in this video, we're going to talk about how to unlock the secrets to relieving GERD and reflux naturally. And this is Dr. Khan. Welcome to the Ask Dr. Khan show, where you're just one video away from solving your chronic health puzzle. Now, GERD is a condition called gastric esophageal reflux disease. This is where you feel like the content of the food that you just ate is coming back up into your throat. And this affects about 20% of the U.S. population. So quite a few people are affected by this, about one in five people. So it's a very common condition. Now, oftentimes people say, well, what's the difference between GERD and heartburn? Well, heartburn is a symptom. It's a symptom that you feel that you have some burning in your chest, especially uh, sometimes could be happening with food intake, sometimes could be happening without food intake. But heartburn is a symptom where GERD is a condition that can involve heartburn as well. Okay, So there are many different causes of heartburn, and GERD could be one of them. Okay, So it's a little bit different. Now, GERD is something we need to watch out for because when you have GERD, you have stomach acid that's constantly refluxing. Reflux means it's going up instead of going down. See, digestion goes from north to south. When you eat food, there's this downward motility that continues to push food down the GI tract. So if food is going up the other way, it's not normal, and that's called reflux. This constant reflux of the stomach acid into your esophagus can be very irritating and inflammatory, can cause tissue damage to your esophagus, and this can lead to a condition called Barrett's esophagus disease. Now, Barrett's esophagus is due to long-standing acid reflux and it's causing some tissue change. So your esophagus tissue basically starts to get red and thickened, starts to change into a different abnormal shape and structure. And Barrett's esophagus then can lead to what's called esophageal cancer. And esophageal cancer is a very serious cancer with about 15% survival rate. So we definitely want to be on the lookout for GERD symptom and address it as soon as we can. Now, conventional treatment for GERD basically involves stomach acid, right? They just give you stomach acid because that's the only thing they got. Everything that's stomach related, they just give you stomach acid reducer. And it can make a difference for people as far as symptom but it doesn't address the root cause of why the problem is there. You see, the problem with GERD is not that you make too much acid. The problem with GERD is that the acid regurgitates back up above this valve called the lower esophageal sphincter, which separates the esophagus and the stomach. So once the food gets past the esophagus into the stomach, it doesn't go back up. It's that area where the valve is not working or the food, there's too much pressure in the stomach that's pushing the food up that's causing the problem, not a stomach acid problem. The stomach acid coming up into the esophagus is the end result of something. It's not the cause of the disease. So therefore, the stomach acid stopping medication is treating the symptom and it can help to treat the symptom of it, but it's not addressing the root cause. So let's talk about what are some of the possible causes that you need to be aware of because once you know the cause, then you know how to fix it. So here are the symptoms of GERD and reflux. So obviously you can have heartburn and remember heartburn is a symptom. Now the heartburn in GERD and reflux typically get worse when you lay down or after a meal. The reason it gets worse when you lay down because you don't have the benefit of gravity. Remember, digestion go from north to south. Gravity kind of helps, but also you have the motility. So usually the heartburn will get worse when you lay down. It makes it easier for the gastric content to reflux back up. You may have the feeling that food is coming back up your throat. You may have the sore throat or burning throat feeling that just won't go away. You may have a cough. A lot of times people have a little cough that they don't have any respiratory illness, but they have this cough that go, don't go away and maybe due to GERD or reflux. You may get hoarse in your throat because it's affecting your esophagus and even can get as high as up into your vocal cords. That can affect voice. It can cause frequent burping. If you're just constantly burping a lot, that can be a result of that. 
You may feel like you have food stuck in your throat or a lump in your throat. You may feel chest pain. A lot of people feel this kind of a heartburn, but it's not burning. They just describe pain in their chest, like something is stuck there. And you may even feel nauseous. So those are the symptoms that can be associated with GERD. Now keep in mind that not every one of those symptoms is caused by GERD alone. And you may have one or multiple symptoms. So we're looking for a constellation, combination of these symptoms and your history to tell us whether it's GERD. Obviously, there's medical tests you can do with endoscopy to actually visualize the esophagus to see if there's any inflammation or redness in the esophagus. And that will be the gold standard way of diagnosing that. Now, there are several mechanisms or causes for why you may have GERD that you may not be hearing from the conventional medical docs. So let's talk about that, okay? First is mechanical. So mechanical issue means that there's too much pressure or stuff in your stomach and it's kind of pushing everything back up. This can be caused by hiatal hernia, which is where the stomach is actually kind of being invaginated by the esophagus. And this hiatal hernia can create that pressure in the stomach and cause that GERD or reflux symptoms. And then some of the things that can cause this hiatal hernia can include obesity. Pregnancy can also do it because you got a baby there that's pushing everything up. So either hiatal hernia itself or even just the weight, right? You have a lot of weight in your abdomen area that can create more pressure as it pushes up. And then also bloating. If you have a lot of bloating, abdominal distension because you have a lot of gas down there and it's kind of pushing up against the stomach, that can just create that back pressure that can be enough to cause a GERD. The bloating can be caused by a condition called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where you have bacteria in the small intestine that's fermenting against food, creating the gas and the bloating, thereby putting pressure on your stomach, creating GERD. So that's a mechanical re reason for that. And then next is delayed. Delayed meaning delayed gastric emptying. If your stomach cannot empty the content from the stomach and make it go down, then the thing kind of just stays there. That can create more back pressure resulting in GERD or reflux. Now, there's a condition that's associated with that called gastroparesis. Paresis means partial paralysis or weakness. So gastroparesis is a weakness or a partial paralysis inability for your stomach muscle to contract and push the food down and empty the gastric content. Now, the reason why someone may have gastroparesis, know that this is primarily a nerve problem. People think gastroparesis is a stomach problem. It's actually a nerve problem because for any muscles in your body to contract, including the stomach muscle, right, for you to create movement, it's a motor function. And any motor function will have to have a nerve innervating that. And the nerve here is the vagus nerve. Now, I made a video about vagus nerve. You can go to my channel and watch it. So vagus nerve dysfunction can lead to gastroparesis and slow gastric emptying. Now, blood sugar problem can also cause gastroparesis. In fact, about 50 up to 90% of the people with blood sugar problems, specifically diabetics, suffer with some kind of gastric emptying or gastroparesis diagnosis. So blood sugar is something to be paying attention to. High fat diet can also cause slow gastric emptying. It's just, it's hard to digest. It takes a long time to break that food down and high fat food tend to slow down your stomach intestinal transit time. And that can also, call, also cause gastroparesis. And then lastly, gut infections, such as from H. pylori. H. pylori is a bacteria that can infect the stomach lining can shut down stomach acid, but can also cause problem with the nerve, the, 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 the stomach itself, or even the vagus nerve that can innervate that. And then SIBO, again, we talked about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or any other type of dysbiosis, gut infection, can impact gastric emptying as well. So that's gastric emptying, which can be caused by a vagus nerve problem, blood sugar problem, high fat diet, or some kind of gut infection. Now next mechanism, of GERD or reflux is a relaxation. Now you might think that well, the relaxation is good, right? Well, not if it's relaxation of the valve that's not supposed to relax. And that's gonna be your lower esophageal sphincter. So anatomically speaking, we have the esophagus, you swallow food, and then here's your stomach. 
And here is a valve. And this valve can constrict. So once the food get past the esophagus, the valve will constrict so the food doesn't come back up. That's the lower esophageal sphincter, meaning it's right at the lower part of that esophagus. So if you have a problem with the lower esophageal sphincter, it's not constricting and it's relaxed too much, that's going to allow stomach content to come up. Now, it turns out that the vagus nerve is very important here as well, because anytime when you have a muscle or a sphincter or a valve, even if it's not under conscious control, it's got to be controlled by something, that's going to be the vagus nerve that controls those digestive function that's not consciously or voluntarily controlled by you. So besides the vagus nerve, which can cause gastroparesis problem and lower esophageal sphincter problem, there are foods that can actually promote the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. These foods include fatty foods, chocolate, mint, garlic, onion, tomato, and citrus. So these foods tend to have a lower esophageal sphincter relaxation effect. Now keep in mind that that doesn't mean that everybody can't eat chocolate or mint or garlic or onion. It's just in people who are susceptible, who already have GERD, and if they notice that when they eat this food, when you eat these food, you get a worsening of your symptom. If you start to pay attention to it and you notice that pattern, then you may want to reduce the intake of those food to help you to feel better faster. Okay, So just keep that in mind. Some people feel like, oh yeah, every time I eat tomato, I feel this reflux or I feel acidy, and they assume that is because the tomato or the citrus is too acidic causing the acid, but when in fact, and maybe the tomato is relaxing the lower esophageal sphincter, causing this reflux type of pattern. Okay. Now the next mechanism is HCL, that's hydrochloric acid or stomach acid. The problem here is usually not too much stomach acid. The problem here may be too little stomach acid. Now how does that work? Well, you need stomach acid to digest food, especially protein food right? Steak and chicken and meat requires a lot of acid for it to degrade the food, to break down the food. And if you don't have enough stomach acid production, then you can't break down that meat or the food very well. Then the food will kind of just sit there longer, kind of like a slow gastric emptying situation. But it's because you don't make enough acid to digest the food. So that food just kind of sits there. And the longer it sits there, more than normal, the more that food kind of ferments and putrefies and now you're going to create this situation where the food actually turns acidic on you because it's putrefying. And your body knows that you got this food that's not digesting well. So what's the natural tendency when you eat something bad, like food poisoning? You want to throw it up, right? So your body creates this reflux, regurgitation, movement against gravity, trying to get that food out because it feels like it's not normal. So having proper stomach acid production is really important. Now you may ask, what's causing the low stomach acid? This is called hypochlorhydria. Hypo means low. Chlorhydria means low stomach acid production. What causes hypochlorhydria? Well, guess what? The vagus nerve again. So see how vagus nerve function is vitally important for digestion. Many of these digestive issues may have a neurological component, hence the gut-brain connection or the brain-gut connection. Okay? So here are the mechanisms that you want to think about when it comes to GERD and reflux. So how do we fix it? Okay, so here are natural solutions to help you with GERD and reflux. First, as we talked about with vagus nerve involved in multiple areas here, but you want to stimulate the vagus nerve. So you can stimulate the vagus nerve by doing humming exercise, gagging exercise, gargling exercise. Again, I made a video recently talking about the vagus nerve in detail. Please go and watch that for more detail. And also, you can just chew your food more. I recommend that for each bite of food, you want to chew it 40 times. Masticate, chew that food 40 times before you swallow. The increased chewing stimulates cranial nerve, cranial nerve 5, which is a trigeminal nerve sensory. So the sensation of the food in your mouth and chewing stimulates cranial nerve 5, which in turn stimulates cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve. So mastication basically turns up your intestinal motility and your vagus nerve. Next, supplements to consider. Know that the for supplements specifically for the vagus nerve. Know that the vagus nerve 
is a nerve that uses acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. So what we say in, in medicine is that it's a cholinergic nerve because it uses acetylcholine as a fuel or chemical to transmit nerve messages. So we can do cholinergic support when it comes to supplements. And the supplement that can provide cholinergic support includes huperzine, which is an herb, alpha-GPC, and phosphatidylcholine. These can help to provide the raw ingredients for, the, for that nerve to have more fuel to work with. Next, we want to address brain inflammation. Now, you may be wondering, okay, why, how is brain inflammation helping with vagus nerve? Well, vagus nerve lives in the brain stem, and vagus nerve takes its input from the brain itself. So brain is presynaptic to the vagus nerve, which means the vagus nerve gets its command and its input or its signal from the brain itself. So if your brain is inflamed, you're going to have less signal going to the vagus nerve. See, the nervous system, central nervous systems, the arrangement is that it's above down. Okay, so it's above down, inside out. So the cortex, the brain, stimulate the vagus nerve. If your brain's inflamed, it can produce less output. Therefore, the vagus nerve is going to have less output. And therefore, your digestive organ is going to have less innervation to it. So we need to address brain inflammation. So how do we address brain inflammation? We can address brain inflammation by healing the gut, healing leaky gut. Because gut inflammation and really systemic body inflammation drives brain inflammation. There's your brain immune gut connection. So healing the gut is a way to heal brain inflammation. And then directly to help the dampen inflammation in the brain itself, we can use nutritional compounds such as fish oil, omega-3 fatty acid from fish oil, is very important uh, structural component of the brain itself. And then we can use turmeric, resveratrol, luteolin, and apigen. And these are flavonoid compounds that have the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier because the blood-brain barrier keep a lot of things out. Only the vital things can get through. But these are nutrients that have an anti-inflammatory effect that can actually cross the blood-brain barrier where it matters. Okay, so we want to be selective with the type of nutrients that we use to help dampen brain inflammation, therefore improve vagus nerve function. Now the next part is diet. So when it comes to diet to help with GERD and reflux, you don't want to eat too close to bedtime. Right? Because if you eat too close to bedtime, you got food in your stomach and you go lay down, then the food's going to have a higher chance of regurgitating back up. Next, you want to avoid lower esophageal sphincter relaxing foods close to bedtime. Now, some people can get away with it by not eating it close to bedtime, like don't eat you know, these things at dinner time or maybe even after 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. But some people, their condition is such that they're very sensitive to these things, that they may have to completely avoid these things. You have to try it and see what works for you. Next, sleeping with the head of the bed raised up by a couple of inches. That could be helpful by sleeping in a more reclined position so that, again, let the gravity do the work for you to help prevent that reflux from happening. And then lastly, stabilize blood sugar. We talk about blood sugar here as one of the things that can cause problem with stomach emptying and but really, the problem here with the, with the blood sugar, if you have low blood sugar, your brain cells and all nerve cells, okay? So vagus nerve being a nerve is composed of neurons. All neurons, including the vagus nerve, requires fuel and activation for them to, fuel and activation to function properly. And fuel for brain cells comes in the form of oxygen and glucose. So if you have hypoglycemia, where you have low blood sugar episodes, you're not going to get enough fuel to the vagus nerve, and they may not be able to function very well. And on the other hand, if you have high blood sugar, such as insulin resistance or diabetes, that's also going to cause problems for the vagus nerve because your brain cells are very sensitive to these fuel fluctuations. High blood sugar is going to cause too much fuel into the system, which drives mitochondria oxidative stress, basically make you more inflamed through oxidative stress and through advanced glycation end product, which is where too much sugar, they become inflammatory compounds, they become sticky and cause nerve damage. So we want to stabilize blood sugar as a way to provide the nerve 
the proper fuel for them to function and not cause inflammation and allow the nerve to heal themselves. Lastly, supplements directly for helping with the stomach lining and this help with the stomach, the GER symptoms, is betaine hydrochloric acid. We talked about hypochlorhydria, lack of stomach acid production, which can actually create some of these false reflux symptoms. Betaine hydrochloric acid, which is supplying acid to your stomach, can help for people who don't have enough stomach acid production in the first place. Now, you can also use apple cider vinegar. Sometimes people do better with one or the other. Try both, see what works better for you. Some people don't tolerate the betaine hydrochloric acid or acid, period, because they have compromised stomach lining. This may be due to other conditions such as H. pylori or gastritis. We'll have a separate training, separate video talking about that. On the note of healing the stomach, DGL, deglycerized licorice root extract, marshmallow root extract, aloe extract, slippery elm. These are all things that are mucilaginous that can help coat the gut and heal the gut. And not only the gut, but also because it's in your stomach when you take these supplements, it can also, if you do have reflux, it can kind of reflux up into the esophagus and kind of have that healing effect there as well. Now, if you have SIBO or dysbiosis, any type of gut infection, we want to address those. And you would address those using some type of antimicrobial herbs or medication if necessary, if it's needed, right? You always consult with your medical provider to see if you have a medical condition that needs to be addressed medically. But from a nutritional and natural perspective, there are things you can support those conditions with SIBO or gut infections. You can use things like berberine, caprylic acid, oregano, grapeseed extract. There are many other choices, but these are the, the classical herbs that we might use to help with dysbiosis. So again, this is explaining the symptoms, the mechanisms, and the natural solutions. Hope that helps you. If you find value in this video, please like this video. Please share this video with others who can benefit from this information. And if you haven't already liked or subscribed to our channels, please do so. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.